Okay, so we have a quadratic inequality. Can we solve this algebraically, yes or no? No, good, no, 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 we cannot, okay? The only types of inequalities we can solve algebraically are linear, which is x to the what? Once, right, x to the one power. And even then, it doesn't always work, right? We have to remember to not to forget to flip the inequality when we multiply or divide by a what? By negative, good, okay? So if it's not linear, like in this case, it's quadratic, we have to solve it a different way. In this case, I've been teaching you to solve it how? By way of a graph, yeah, a picture. So in order to sketch the graph, we need to know some information about it. So first of all, it's a quadratic, so the graph is gonna look like a what? What do we call a graph of a quadratic? Parabola, Parabola. good. Is it smiling or frowning? It's frowning, right? You would think if it were in a math class, it'd be smiling, right? Like y'all. Um, but it's frowning. And how do we know it's frowning? It's opening down because the negative where? It is in the front, but it doesn't have to be in the front. But it's on the one with the largest leading coefficient. Very good. Whenever you have a negative leading coefficient, the parabola opens down. Okay, so in order to answer this question, we're looking for the values of x that make that parabola, the graph of the parabola, if you will, negative or zero. So we need to know the x-intercepts, which are also called roots or zeros. And for that, we need to do what with the quadratic? We need to F it, right? <clears throat> which in this class means what? Factor it, yeah. So the first rule of factoring is looking for a common factor, and there's nothing common other than one or negative one. But again, we are gonna factor out the negative one. So you have two options here. If you work straight down in the flow of the problem, you have the responsibility and the burden, if you will, to make sure that everything is equivalent to the line above and below, right? Otherwise, you're going to lose points. If you want to take that off to the side to factor it, where, you know, I'm not going to dock you if it's, if it's not perfect notation, do that. I'm going to work straight down, right? You might as well. So the first step I'm going to do is just to factor out the negative. Like that. And at this point, you're kind of at a fork in the road. You want to take it, don't you? All right? Complete that silverware set. That was a Yogi Bear quote. Yogi Bear run, not Yogi Bear, right? Yogi Bear's quote was like, go there, boo boo. Y'all know who Yogi Bear was? The Yankees catcher? Yeah. Okay. So, what do I mean at a fork in the road? Well, you have this negative out front. It's not an expression, it's an inequality. So if you keep the negative, like I'm gonna do, I'll show you how to do that. But some people last period said, I'm a positive person, I'm gonna get rid of that negativity. And they multiplied both sides by negative one, which is fine. It would be gone from the left side, and what do you do with the inequality when you do that? You flip it, so it would become greater than or equal to. Now when you do that, you kind of change the graph, because without the negative there, it's gonna be a parabola that opens up, and now you're looking to see where it's greater than zero. So that's up to you, entirely up to you. I'm going to embrace the negativity, right? Because it makes me a better person. And I'm going to factor it where it sits. Now it's just an x squared, so that's an x. So again, factors of negative 21 that add up to positive four. And what's the other one? Seven and three. Negative three, positive seven, good, all right? So now from here, we're done with the inequality part. You can't go any further with the inequality or you can lose points. You cannot say X plus seven is less than or equal to zero or X minus three is less than or equal to zero. It does not work, okay? Remember, it might work once in a while, but if it doesn't work every time, we say it doesn't work in math, right? So what we're gonna do though is because it's factored, we're gonna find the x-intercepts, the roots, the zeros. So that's x equals negative seven and x equals three. Now again, a word about the equality. If you leave it like that, I know what you're thinking, I know what you're doing, but you're lying, okay? Because this is not equal to that. This is not the solution to that. These are just the roots of these factors. So if you're gonna work straight down and you're kind of done with the work, you wanna put something here like roots. Colon, that means I'm listing stuff. Or if you don't want to put roots, you can put 
zeros, right? It's the same thing. Or if you don't want to put zeros, you could put X intercepts, whatever. They're all the same thing. Now I know that you're not claiming this to be the solution to that. And that's fine, all right? Bless you, little details. Now from here, we're gonna sketch our graph. So give yourself an X and Y axis. It's just a sketch, right? So it doesn't have to be you know, entirely accurate. There's negative seven, there's positive three. And since I kept the, the negative out front, my parabola still opens downward or down, whatever. So there it is, that's good enough, good enough. That's all we need to answer the question correctly. If you've looked at some of the practice tests, one, one through one, three on my website or on the, on the link that I gave you in Canvas, there's a free response question that has you solve a quadratic inequality and it says, make sure you show the graph. So that would get a check right there, all right? Now we return to the original inequality. It says less than or equal to zero. So do your math homework, right? When's it due? Monday, Monday now, right? So less than zero is where in relation to the x-axis, above or below? Less than zero, below. So I wanna know where is this graph below the x-axis and then equal to zero is on the x-axis. So if you wanna shade it, you don't have to, but it does help, right? Helps me, seeing is believing. There it is. So now that I've identified the y values I'm looking for, the solution is for what values of x does that happen, right? And when you first learned about the number line before you even looked at the vertical number line on top of it, you probably sketched like inequalities um, on a number line graph. So you can graph the solution if you want. The y values are negative outside the x-intercepts, okay? So for a parabola, the solution is always gonna be either outside or between the x-intercepts, right? So in this case, if you wanna sketch it, uh, you could put a solid dot here and then shade to the left. Or maybe your teacher taught you instead of a solid dot, you can put a bracket. That means inclusive. It's the same as a solid dot. I'll put both. And then over here, it's at three and then to the right. So there's the number line solution. You don't have to do that. I'm not going to make you show the number line solution. But it does kind of help you set up your interval notation if you choose to answer that way. And you do have to answer one of those ways on the test, all right? So an interval notation, here's what it would look like. We start way down the number line on the left. And for interval notation, we need a placeholder. What placeholder do we use for way down there? Negative infinity, good. With a parenthesis, right? And then we put a comma and we go all the way up to negative seven with a beefy bracket, all right? And then we join them together with that symbol, which is what? or it's the union symbol it means or and then we pick up with a beefy bracket three and we cruise all the way to infinity so the numbers get the brackets here because it was less than or equal to zero but infinity and negative infinity never ever 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 get the bracket right because if you put a bracket around infinity you're saying what that i can include it right and that means you've been there you can't go there, right? I've been to infinity, sir. No, you haven't. Quit lying, right? Now, when you write your interval like that, it kind of looks like it's bald. It's standing out there all alone. So to keep it in the context of X intervals, we put this out front, remember? X epsilon, X epsilon. So that's the solution, right, interval. All the values of X that make the original inequality true are in this interval or that interval. And it's an or case, so it's two disjoint, we say, non-overlapping intervals. The x values that work are either here or here, not both, okay? It can't be in two places at once. Um, or you can use the inequality notation, uh, which is this, x is less than or equal to negative seven, or x is greater than or equal to three, right? You typically, I mentioned yesterday, write the word or instead of using the union symbol. Now, let me talk about one extra thing here on the inequality notation, because I know you've seen this before. You can kind of fancy up the inequality solution and write it as a solution set, right? 
a solution set. In mathematics, we denote a set with a brace on either end. We call those braces. They're like the squiggly parentheses. It looks kind of like a, a Bob Hope or a Jay Leno profile, if you know who either one of those guys are. And we read that as the set of all, and then I left the space in the front because we define our variable x here, and then we put a vertical line. So this is essentially what's called set builder notation, as opposed to like roster notation. The set of all x, you remember how we read this? Such that, very good, such that. It means that we're putting some qualifications now. The solutions are the set of all x's, provided that x is here or x is there. That's what it means, okay? So when you see that as a multiple choice question on the test, whenever we have inequalities, I fancy it up with the set builder notation, okay? So you can go with interval notation too if you want, x epsilon. So that at least preserves the x, all right? Cool, if you had gotten rid of the negative, you would get the exact same answer because now your parabola would open up and you'd wanna know where it's positive, right? And that would still be outside the interval. So do it the correct way, different roads take you to the same correct answer, okay? Questions on that? All right, before I get into the next example, uh, let me just introduce someone who's gonna be with us every Thursday for the entire semester. Texas State intern, Mr. Tolly, he'll be back there. So yeah, there you go. No, yeah, yeah. Hey, he's he's brave for being here. I told him all about my third period class and how bad y'all were, and yet he's still here. Look at that. Yeah, he actually wants to be a math teacher. So that that is bravery right there. Yeah. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to you know call him over to your desk if I'm like busy you know, doing something like uh, rearranging the books on the shelf and I can't come to you, just, you know, call him over. He's happy to help. Um, yeah, anyway. Okay. Any other questions? That literally wasn't a question. But... All right. So let's get back to um, letter B. All right. Letter B. Did we finish letter B in here yesterday? No. No, okay. We were about to finish. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, you're like. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, you know what? That's where I lost my voice. Like, I've been like eating like uh, throat lozenges again, you know, since yesterday afternoon this morning, just as it was coming back. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go through it again to recap, right? Like a box score type of thing. Uh, all right, we have a complex fraction. It's a fraction over a fraction. Boom, got it. Um, we have a numerator and we have a denominator, right? We have big numerators, which is everything above the red line. We have big denominators, everything below the red line. But we also have miniature numerators and denominators. So we highlighted the miniature denominators, right? Miniature denominators does sound kind of cute, right? Now, I didn't tell you this yesterday, so I'll tell you this morning. because It just happened this morning. We had our our pictures this morning for the yearbook staff, right? I think juniors have photos today during their English class or something. Um, I'm glad they didn't have it during the math class. They know what's important, right? Yeah. No, English is important too, so you can speak more gooder, okay? Um, but anyway, I was going down there, you know, with Coach Fair. Hey, hey, it's picture time again, Coach Fair. I see you wore your fancy t-shirt today. He's like, yeah, I sure did. Um, I made that up. He's not wearing a t-shirt, he's wearing a polo. I'm the one wearing the t-shirt, original swarm, baby. Um, but anyway, we get down there and uh, Miss Kinsey, have you seen her on campus? She's the counselor lady and she has a dog that she brings to school every day. How lucky is that? She's been training a dog to be a service dog and uh, his name is Hank. He's like a, yeah, he's like a little lassie. He's like a miniature lassie. Yeah, Hank. Yeah. Anyway, so she's behind me in line on the stage and I'm like, is Hank getting his photo taken too? Ha 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 for the yearbook. She's like, you're darn tootin'. And I'm like, whoa, that is so cool. What a lucky class this is to be able to get a yearbook at the end of the year and go through the faculty and staff and there's Hank. I don't know where they're gonna put Hank because I don't know his last name, if he has one or not, but Hank will be in there somewhere, Hank. And so maybe in the front, right? On the cover. So anyway, 
long story short, I asked Miss Kinsey, hey, um, can, can I take a picture with Hank for the yearbook? Can he, can he be in my picture too? Um, you know, and she's like, if Hank allows you to take a picture with him, that would be fine. So I walked up there, he was a good boy, right? And Hank said he would agree to be in the photo with me. So I sat down. Uh, he did. He did. He went, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. So I sat down and I put my legs to the side and I thought I was perfect. And that's when she says, okay, now move your head to the side. I'm like, no, this doesn't feel right. Now move your chin up. No, this really feels weird, right? And it always comes out great. And then Hank, come on, jump my lap. And Hank jumped in there. And man, I was frowning because I hate picture day. But as soon as he landed in my lap, boom, big old beaming smile. And I think Hank was smiling too. Um, and they took a picture and they showed me and it's the best yearbook photo I've ever taken because of Hank. Yeah. Now, not only was I with Hank, but I wore my Unicorn Loves Chili hat too, because I feel like people need to know. Yeah. yeah. And I did talk Coach Fair into wearing the hat too. Um, so anyway, Hank, Hank the dog, he'll be, he loves math. He'll be in there twice. He didn't get in the picture with Fair for some reason, uh, but he'll be in the yearbook twice. So way to go, Hank. Anyway, uh, cute, right? Hank's cute. So are the miniature denominators. I need to do the lick em over lick em. Yeah, least common what? Multiple, okay. So to find the least common multiple of your denominators, we need a factor, so that's what we did. We factored and we got X plus one, which I grouped together, and then X plus one squared, right? So the LCM, just to review, someone can tell me, we did it with numbers, but how do we spot an LCM with variable factors? Unless you just know you were born with the gift of spotting variable LCMs. What are we looking for? What? Oh, that's the right answer to a different question. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about that? I'll start you off. We need at least one representative factor of each type. Well, we only have one type. And then take the largest exponent on each type. So, very good. I need an x plus 1 factor. This one's to the first. This one's squared. So, x plus 1 squared. Good. Boom. All right. So, <clears throat> now I'll pick up at this line here. We're going to multiply by x plus 1 squared, but I think I'm going to write it as x plus 1, x plus 1, just this first time so you can see what's actually happening. And again, I left it kind of floating because, remember if I'm running for office, my motto? Did I even say that yesterday? No, oh, my motto if I were running for political office would be like, hey, bunk beds for all, right? So we have the upstairs apartment, and they've got bunk beds. The downstairs apartment, and they got bunk beds. So I'm going to put these over one. So now they're on the top bunk, right? Okay. Now, here's how the lick them over lick them works. Forget about the downstairs apartment for right now, okay? Put them off the screen. They're, they're living downstairs. We are upstairs visiting the family up above, and it would be rude to be upstairs talking with them, thinking about the downstairs people, right? Live in the moment. Be, be present when you're talking to people. So I'm going to put a dot here. Anything now that's a factor in the numerator and the denominator does what? Don't say cancel. Divide Divides out. out. Very good. So that's why we drew a line through this one and then either one of those. And what does that leave in the bottom down there? It leaves a one, right? So the guy that I'm running against in office, I'm, I'm the guy that gives everybody a bunk bed, but my opposing candidate is the bunk bed destroyer. Okay, and that's what we did here. That's what he did here. Because anything divided by one is itself, right? So there's no more bunk beds upstairs. We're left with x cubed over one, which is just x cubed. And we're left with x plus one over one, which is x plus one. So when you do the lick them over lick them method, you will be destroying bunk beds proverbially, okay? You're not actually taking beds away from people who need them. So don't feel bad, okay? Um, that's how you get rid of the complex fractions because the bug beds are the complex part. All right, now we go downstairs, right? Knock, knock, come in. All right, we're there. And we do the same thing, right? Oh, we're left with a one, X over one, one over one. What are we left with in the bottom? 
just x, yeah. So on the next line, we take inventory. We're left with x cubed times x plus one. We don't need the over one. And at the bottom, we're just left with x. And that is a long division bar, but that's okay. Um, and this is where then I brought up the football game last Friday about, hey, the game's still going on. I'm not gonna yell again, because I'm still recovering. Um, but yeah, there's more to do here. So don't start celebrating too early. All we did is we got rid of the complex fraction. That's it. We're still going to try and simplify. And it's factored in the top. So we can always divide out any common factors. Hey, I spy an x cubed over x. What does that simplify to? x squared. So we're left with x squared times x plus 1, which is both a fine and a dandy answer. We can stop there. Um, and at this point, if you want to distribute you know, that's, that's fine too. So depends on what we want to do with this expression, how we want to use it. We may prefer it factored, we may prefer it expanded, okay? But again, working straight down, is every line equivalent to the one above and below it? Mine is, is yours. Because on the test and the free response, I will be a looking, I will be a looking. And I might even bring Hank along just for an extra set of eyes, of course. That might just distract me, right? Because I'll be petting the dog. <laughs> petting Hank. Yeah. Good boy. He's actually being officially trained, like at Texas A&M. He kind of looks like Reveille. He wears a little maroon vest. Um, but there's, there's really, like, no laws, like, governing what it takes to become, like, a therapy dog. You can just, like, you can put, like, a piece of paper over a dog and write on their my therapy dog, and then you carry him, carry him through the HEB. What? What? This is my therapy dog. You could do that. But he's actually being trained. It's like 160 hours that she and Hank have to attend together. It's kind of like college. Yeah, and when she can't make it because of whatever, a hair appointment, Hank goes by himself. What a dog. Did you have a question? Is the second X for the bottom one, is that squared? What? Down here? X cubed plus X. I'm done. I'm glad you saw that. Yeah. No, no, please say something. Because this is a good talking point. Do you think I know what X squared times 1 is? Do you think I know? <laughs> right? I took a guess, I guess. Yeah, no, I didn't study. No, of course I know it's X squared. So I obviously wrote it down incorrectly, and this one was by pure accident, right? So we call this a stupid mistake, question mark? No, a careless mistake, right? It was carelessness. And so how, how can you avoid careless mistakes? Stay in the zone. Cross the tape at the end of the race. You know what I just did here? I was running a marathon, and I ran the first 26 miles and then I didn't run the last 300 yards. I didn't run through the tape at the end of the race. I knew what the answer was supposed to be. And by the time I got here, I said, hey, brain, you go over there. Hand, you finish up. And the hand is like, I don't know what to do. I'm just a hand. And it wrote X instead of X squared. No, it's X squared. Yeah. I was thinking about Hank the dog, and it messed me up. This is why you don't have phones out. This is why you don't listen to music, because if you get distracted, you're going to make a careless mistake. Yes? How big is this, uh, this is, uh, Well, if this is where Hank is standing, he comes up to about here. That's with his, like, half-inch thick vest. So maybe about right here without the vest. Okay. Yeah. He's a long-haired dog. Hey, he's cute. Go by and see Miss Kenzie and say, hey, we're here to see... Miss Kenzie, we're here to see Miss Kenzie. We have a question about the schedule. And when you get back to this, be like, ah, I punk you. I'm here for Hank. Yeah. Hey, thank you for catching that. If you ever see me make a mistake up here, don't be like, I saw that, but I didn't want to. Okay. My wife does it all the time. Just point out my mistakes. I'll fix them. Okay. At least I can fix them here. I can't fix them at home, right? We had that. Say, change, flip. I can't change. I can't change. I can't change. Can't change. But I can fix this, okay? All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right.
Now, let this simmer on the back burner. Stir it occasionally so it doesn't stick to the pan on the bottom. We're going to go to part C, letter C. And um, it doesn't involve complex fractions, but it does involve fractions, OK? We have two fractions. I want to combine these into a single fraction. We did this at the beginning of the year with numbers, right? Not numbers. This, not numbers. These have variables. But when we did it with numbers, that was enough to make some people go like, I'm heading to academic freestyle, right? But not y'all. Y'all are the survivors. How does the rest of the song go? I don't know. Thanks for staying around, guys. We need to get two terms into one term. They're fractions. We need a what to combine them? Common denominator, right? And hopefully it is the least common multiple of the denominators, right? Hopefully. So. First thing I would do is put parentheses around these dudes so that they look like factor groups, right? Binomial factors. What is the LCM then of x plus five and x minus three? X plus five, x minus three. What are we doing between those? Adding them, multiplying them, dividing them? Multiplying them, good, because LCM, the M stands for multiplying. Okay, good. So. It follows the same rule, right? You need at least one of each factor type. We have two types. And you take the larger exponent on each type, where they're both ones. So when the LCM of two quantities, whether they're numbers or variable expressions, is their product, we call those two factors what in relation to each other? Co-prime, good. Boom, they're co-prime. So anytime we have co-prime factors, that's a good candidate for the crisscross applesauce butterfly multiply method, right? Right? It works with numbers. It should work here as well. Now, if you don't want to do that, multiply this by x minus 3 over x minus 3 with a line between them. Multiply this one by x plus 5 over x plus 5. That's fine. But I think we could do the crisscross applesauce. Now, does it matter if we start in the top left or top right? Does it matter? In general, does it matter? Big time, yes. Big time, yes. Some people are doing this and they're starting in the top right. And if it's subtraction, you get the wrong answer. Okay? You got to start in the top left, just like you're reading a page in a book, right? Or on your iPad. You start in the top left. That's where we have to start. So here we go. Product down that first diagonal, 1 times x minus 3. Why did I write the one? Do I need it? No. Do I need the parentheses if I don't put the one? No. Why did I write them both? Inventory purposes. All right. I know that I didn't just forget to do something. Middle sign is plus. Next diagonal, two times x plus five. Now there I do need the two, and there I do need the x plus five. And it's all over the product, x plus five times x minus three. All right, is the game over? Do we call Mikey Farias over and take a picture with him? No, no, we don't. Mikey warned him. He said, yo, guys, I don't want to take you all I don't want to get y'all in trouble. You know, and I think when he said that, that's when Coach Mangold actually heard. So anyway, we still try to simplify as much as possible on the back end here. So if you notice, uh, let's see, we've got x minus 3, x minus 3, x plus 5, x plus 5. <laughs> Right? And what are we left with? We're left with 1 plus 2, which is 3, right? Boom. DC calculus, here I come. Questions on that one? We good? All right, so that was pretty easy, right? You like that problem? Don't let me call my wife. She'll tell you, hey. I'm sure you did something wrong. Look for it. That's not right. Two plus one? Yeah, that's three. But before that, can I divide out those x minus? No, that feels naughty, doesn't it? Yeah, you're about. What did I already tell you? Don't about to say save. Save. Just save. Say, Mr. Corby, I'm not your wife. But I do find flaws in you. 
Yeah. No. Why can we not divide these out, Mr. Rodriguez? Very good. In the top, they are part of two terms. We can only divide out common fa, 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 fa. factors, right? They're factors in the bottom. They're not factors in the top. They're factors in two separate terms. So we can't do that. Don't be so, you know, implicitly trusting of me or complicitly trusting of me, right? Question everything respectfully, right? And then wait for the consequences. What's that? But I'm human. Well, you are, you're just oh, thank you. Right. I'm subhuman. I'm sorry. Um, what can we do? Well, in the top, let me distribute the one and let me distribute the two. I get X minus three plus two X plus 10. That looks good. And in the bottom, do I want to expand and distribute the bottom? No. Did you say it? Why, why not no? You're right. No, you do have a clue. Come on, we Longhorns have to stick together. Very good. Yeah. Um, our goal is to simplify, right? The top was partially factored. You'll know this afterwards. The top was partially factored. There was nothing in common we could pull out. So we expanded it in the hopes of maybe collecting like terms. The bottom though, however, is completely factored. Yes, yes. And if we are to simplify a fraction, we can only divide out common what's? Factors. So we don't know if we are going to be able to divide anything out, but in the hopes that we might be able to, leave the bottom factored for now, right? And let's go ahead and expand the top. So I just have to rewrite the bottom. There we go. And now we'll collect like terms, x plus 2x, 3x, negative 3 plus 10, plus 7. Boom. All over, x plus 5, x minus 3. Now, question. Is there a factor of 3x plus 7 in the denominator? No. No, there's not. So we're not going to be able to divide anything out. Shucks. But, oh, well, at least we're ready, right? Like y'all are for a quiz every day when you walk in. So you could stop right here. But at this point also, if you want, you could expand the bottom if you want to do that. That's x squared. What's the sum of the inner and outer? 2. 5x minus 3x is plus 2x minus 15. Okay? So that's, that's another equally simplified version. We're going to study rational functions later in the year, and they're a lot of fun. Okay? This would be a rational function if you gave it a name like Fred of x. Okay? We want both versions of these when we study them because in this version, we can immediately tell what values give us division by zero, right? Negative five and positive three. They're not going to be in the domain. They're going to be discontinuities. In fact, that function has two vertical asymptotes, one at x equals negative five, x equals three. So we like the factored version. This version, though, is useful for finding like y-intercepts. It's also useful for determining what we call the end behavior, for determining what the graph does if you zoomed out and looked at it from outer space. Turns out this graph has a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis, and we could tell that quickly by looking at this version. So we'll teach that later on. So we like both versions, okay? They're both good. Two different versions of the same thing is not bad at all, right? Okay. Questions on that? Any any other errors or mistakes that you caught there? All right, cool. Well, let's move on to D then, because this is what's been simmering on the back burner. I'm deliberately getting away. Letter D. What kind of fraction have we here? A complex fraction, because we have a main division bar, and in the numerator, we have a fraction. Yeah. Do we also have a fraction in the denominator? No? Where'd your teacher go? Where's Mr. Carpy? I played this game with Hank this morning. He was like, Ur? <laughs> it's still me. Where's Mr. Carpy? Ur? It's me. Hank was like, how'd you do that? Right? <laughs> Hank doesn't know that. But y'all do. 
just like y'all know that negative exponents are the exact same thing as what? Fraction. fraction. <laughs> Boom. You can't use a negative exponent to disguise a fraction and vice versa. That doesn't work. Most decimals, yeah. See, same thing. We learned that, right? We do have fractions in the bottom. They're just in quote unquote disguise. So let's get rid of the negative exponents, yeah? Is that what you're going to suggest? You're the student. I'm only the teacher. What were you going to say? Yes. Bring them to the bottom. I was going to suggest bringing them to the top. But you said bring them to the bottom. Would bringing them to the top work? I mean, we can certainly do it, right? Just like we can break and enter and do drugs illicitly. We could do all that, but it's not the right thing. We're not going to do that either. You know why we don't do that here? Because guess what sign is between them? A minus sign. So these two dudes are not factors. They are what? Terms. The rules of exponents only work with factors. Yeah. But I see students just try to bring that to the top, bring it to the bottom, and they're like, hmm, I wonder what we do with the negative sign that was there. I guess we just write it like that. I guess there's a hyphen in the denominator now. Right? Yeah, that doesn't work. But what we're going to do is what we were suggested. In their respective positions, boom, right there on the bottom left, we're going to write x to the negative second as what? One over x to the second. Negative exponents, don't make the number negative. They're not radicals in disguise, they're fractions, right? That's x to the negative second over one. You could bring it to the bottom. That's what you were, yeah. Yeah, just go, just like exactly what I was trying to communicate, Mr. Corby, but you kept interrupting me, right? Yeah. One over x squared. 1 over y squared. There you go. That's what you do. Think of it as a matrix, right? You got your top left position, top right position, bottom left, bottom right. You're going to keep things in the same position. Now, this is like a glorious complex fraction because now we have fractions in the top and the bottom. We'll stay change flip work here as it is. Bless you. Stay, stay, stay. Change, flip. Which one of these would I flip? This or this or both? Or me? State change flip doesn't work here. You know why? Because there's two terms down there. State change flip only works when you're dividing by a single fraction. Okay? So rather than have to get a common denominator in the numerator and combine them, and get a common denominator in the denominator and combine them, and then state change flip, oh, cramp. We're going to do it in one fell swoop by using the new method that's called what? Baby shark? Do, 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 do. Baby shark? Do, do. Is that what you're going to say? I know you like to sing. You were saying baby denominators. Yeah. Yeah. I call them miniature denominators, but I kind of like baby denominators. Why do we even look at the baby denominators? Because the method is called lick them over lick them. Lick them over lick them. Okay. Now you look at your baby or miniature denominators. Do, 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 do. Baby denominators. Do, 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 do. What is the LCM of y and x and x squared and y squared? X squared minus y squared? Question mark. I heard you right. What does the M stand for in LCM? Schreiber? Multiple. Multiple. What are you doing with them? Subtractables, right? What should this be? There you go. Seguro. Times, okay? Now, why is it x squared, y squared? Because we need at least one representative factor of each type. We need an x factor. We need a y factor. And then we take the biggest, largest, representative exponent on each type, which is two. You just did this where?
Kind of similar, right? They're all kind of similar, right? They're all fun easy, right? Once you know how. So here we go. Upstairs, downstairs problem. Ex expand this out and put parentheses here. X squared, Y squared over one. X squared, Y squared over one. I'm gonna put parentheses here now because unlike the previous problem right above it or two previous ago, we have multiple terms, which means we have to take this and distribute it to both terms. Ooh, this is what makes it so fun. Now, because this is an honors class, we're gonna to learn to do this in our head. You could take a whole separate line and physically write this behind the first term, physically write it behind the second term. But that's a whole lot of writing. We don't wanna do that. Plus we wanna stretch ourselves a little bit. So again, forget about the downstairs people for now. If you were to distribute this to the first term, something's gonna divide out, right? Look what you have down here. I'm gonna bring it up so you can see it. We have this factor of y in the bottom and what's gonna divide out? We have an x squared, y squared in the top. So this y will divide out with one of these y's. Yes, yes. And it'll be leaving us a y to the first times x squared. So what would we be left with in the top? Because the bunk bed is destroyed. We're left with the x that was there times an x squared times the one y that's left, yes? We're left with an x times x squared times y to the first. Let's write that down. x times x squared is x cubed, y to the first, or just y. If you understand what we just did there, then you'll understand the whole method, okay? We do it now again. I don't want to divide this out. I don't want to say, because then I'm messing this up and I need to use it again. You do the next one. When you distribute this to here, what's going to divide out and what's left? It's going to be minus whatever's left in the top bumps. Good, 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 yeah. Um, this X will divide out with one of these X's, leaving just a single X there. So we're gonna be left with the Y times the X times the Y squared. So in alphabetical order, we're left with X to the first times Y cubed. X to the first times Y cubed. There you go, there you go. All over. Y squared minus X squared. Yes, we'll pick up right there tomorrow, okay? Have a great rest of the day. And uh, don't forget, baby shark, do, 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 baby shark, do, 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 do. I don't want to remember that. No? Uh.